Hi, everybody. It is February 10th, 2022. That means that it is Black History Month and it is the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development. My name is Levi Moore and I'm an outdoor environmental educator that works for the WRDSB. Uh, I chose to do my territorial acknowledgement today from the Camp Heidelberg Outdoor Environmental Education Centre. This property, like all of the properties in the WRDSB, is on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Neutral People. We recognize their enduring presence in our community, their customs, their laws, and their culture. I wanted to use the few minutes that I had with you this morning to talk about trees and use trees as an example of how we can build a relationship with the land and how we can demonstrate our respect for that land through the proper use of, of naming of names. So let's do it. I'm gonna flip this camera around. And we're gonna go for a walk. So this is the Camp Heidelberg Outdoor Environmental Education Center Forest. And you can see it is full of trees. I really can't express too much how deeply I love trees. Uh, the trees just genuinely make me happy. Uh, just looking at a tree makes me happy. Uh, certainly hanging out under a tree uh, in the shade on a hot summer day uh, is delightful. But trees do so ma many other wonderful things for us. Like uh, they make us oxygen. I like breathing a fair bit, so that seems really great. Uh, trees also suck up carbon dioxide in an age of climate change, uh, having something that naturally sucks up carbon dioxide for us and removes it from the atmosphere, that seems really great too. Trees also provide us with fruit, they provide us with wood, their roots hold on to the soil, when there's leaves on the trees, they're a really important part of the water cycle, the list goes on and on. Trees are wonderful. Um, it strikes me as odd then that if, if trees are so important, why is it that so many of us have a hard time naming more than a handful of species? Um, I think maybe this is symptomatic of what you might call a broken relationship with the environment or with our earth. And I've kind of, I've wondered about this off and on over the years as an environmental educator and uh, it wasn't until recently when I had uh, a conversation with a friend of mine. His name's Garrison McCleary. Uh, he is Lenepe. Uh, he is Indigenous. And he shared his perspective on this. And I thought it was really insightful, and that's why I wanted to share it with you today. He said, we don't respect trees um, because we think of them as objects that are there for our benefit, things that we can take he said, in an indigenous culture like his own, trees are seen as non-human people. They recognize the personhood of things like trees. And because they think of them as people, they, they give them the same respect as they would any other member of their community. My Western culture does not afford trees that same personhood, and hence, we don't respect them, and hence that, which is why I would say that we have a broken relationship with trees. So how can we mend this? How can we fix our relationship with nature and the environment? Well, if we wanted to demonstrate our respect for trees, maybe something we could do is use their proper names, use, um, figure out what they're called. Um, just like you would call a friend by their name as a sign of respect for them as an individual, we should figure out the names of the trees in our community. And this might be a first time for many of you, so I'm going to show you a few examples of the most common trees you might expect to find in Waterloo Region, uh, but I'm also going to put a resource in the description below this video. Uh, it's a, a tree guide, a winter tree guide that Al, another one of the outdoor environmental educators and I worked on, uh, I'm really happy with it. It will help you ident identify trees at any time of year, but in particular in the winter. So I'm going to challenge you after this video or at some point today to go outside with the key and try and identify 
a couple of the trees in near your home, maybe in your backyard or on your street. And when you do, when you figure out what that tree is called, I want you to call it by its name. And, and that's a sign of respect for that tree as an individual, and it's important for your relationship with, with the earth. Okay, so here's our first tree. I'm gonna turn the camera. So here we have a, a unique tree that's much too big for us to be looking at twigs or even leaves. Like even if this tree had leaves, they're so high up, we wouldn't really be able to use them to identify them. But thankfully this tree has really unique bark. This is an ash tree. And ash trees have this really neat cross-hatch pattern to their bark. So this is ash, A-S-H. And the reason we call it ash trees actually, because uh, in the springtime, the flowers come out before the leaves. And the flowers are very, very fine and delicate. And they create this haze around the top of the tree. And it looks like a halo of ashes just ringing the treetop, which is why a long time ago, someone decided to name this an ash tree. So, who is that? So, here we found another great tree. This might be one of the easiest trees to identify in the forests of the Waterloo region and has really unique bark. So when you look at the bark of this tree, it looks sort of like burnt cornflakes. And that's that's a handy thing because it's actually its actual name is black cherry. Burnt cornflakes, the first initials are B C. Black cherry, the first initials are BC. So a handy little memory trick helps us figure out that this is black cherry. And to confirm this, we can look on our key. So here's our twig key. And here we can see black cherry. Bark, black cornflakes. If there were any buds low enough to, to reach, we would probably would see that the buds have this red, brown, dark uh, scale tips. And there's really only a handful of trees that have this uh, bicolored pattern to their twigs or to their buds. So that would be another really handy characteristic. Right. So second tree, another really easy one. Great. And this is a big one. Okay, so what do we have here? What clues are there to the species identification? So, big tree. Um, it's got really unique bark with fairly shallow ridges, and everything looks sort of like it's been dusted in flour, or um, I like to say it looks like it's been whitewashed or something. So uh, that's pretty unique. Uh, the buds in this tree, given its size, are hard to find. However, there is a branch over here that will help that's falling off and it's in the snow. So if we get a little closer and look at the buds, um, that's handy. They're short, pointy. Oh, hey, look at that. This is the branching pattern we saw before. Opposite branching pattern stem, two branches opposite each other. Again, if we look at the terminal bud, main terminal bud, and then two auxiliary buds on either side. That's pretty handy. Okay, so let's compare that to our chart. And there it is, sugar maple. So we've found ourselves a sugar maple. It's got that whitewashed uh, bark with shallow grooves, a terminal bud. It has two auxiliary buds right on either side. And of course, it's got that opposite branching pattern. 
So, sugar maple. Excellent. So, what, while all trees are important, uh, I, think, I think the sugar maple has a particularly rich history given its use as a source of sugar, and it has a deep connection to local indigenous culture. This is Danny Woodpecker. Uh, I love Robin Kimmerwall's description in her book, uh, Braiding Sweetgrass, about how the maple buds help to cue a maple tree to make sap. Uh, the syrup is, uh, the syrup season rather, is in the spring, and sap flows when the nights are cold, uh, but the days are warm. Uh, a winter thaw, however, can sometimes make conditions uh, like this, uh, even though it's not, it's not the right time of year. Uh, so, and, and it's interesting because the tree will not start making sap, even in the, the sort of, uh, this fake spring that happens sometimes. And, and you have to wonder, well, why not? And, uh, Robin's daughter, Larkin, asks, uh, how do the trees know when it's time if they cannot see the thermometer? Um, and it's interesting to think that, like, the trees can't really see at all. So, um... The solution, Robin explains to her daughter in her book, is that uh, it's in the buds. Uh, each bud is packed with phytochromes, and uh, these are little light-absorbing pigments that cue the tree to day length. Uh, this is how a maple tree is not tricked by winter thaw. It's pretty amazing. The bud, really every bud, is a sensor that allows the tree to see day length. That's so cool. There are uh, over 90 different types of tree in Waterloo Region. Everyone's unique, everyone's special. Uh, we have 34 in our key, and uh, those are the most common ones you might expect to find in Waterloo Region. Uh, so I encourage you to download the key, head out for a walk, and see how many different types of tree you can name. If you want to take this a step further, um, bring a measuring tape along and a ruler and uh, figure out how big around the tree is, that's the tree's circumference, and um, figure out how tall the tree is using the ruler. And I know that sounds kind of crazy, but we have a great video that shows you how you can do this. Uh, and then with those two measurements, use the calculator that we've uh, attached to this document, and uh, you can figure out how, basically how much carbon is in that tree which in an age of climate change is pretty important. Trees represent a natural solution uh, to climate change. If we can preserve and protect our trees in our community, maybe, maybe plant a few more, this can be really a really meaningful way to help address a pretty important ecological problem facing our, our culture and our community. All right, thanks very much everybody. Ooh, it's getting so chilly. I'm gonna call it quits. Have a good day. Bye for now.